Hello beloved and welcome to this evening's message. Uh, we're looking still at the book of Revelation and we are in Revelation chapter 2 verse 12 to 17 where we're going to look at the church in Pergamos where Jesus writes this amazing letter to this congregation and he does it through the Apostle Paul, remember? And he writes it to the messenger or the angel or the elder or the pastor uh, of the church. And he speaks to them in Pergamos. And he has quite a few things to say to them. And we're not going to finish it in one session for tonight. So what we're going to do is, God willing, next week we will continue to look at the church in Pergamos. But for now, before we continue, let's just have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can come to you and ask you to please open up your word to us so that we may understand it is the Lord Jesus Christ who sent this letter to the church in Pergamos, and we want to understand. We really, truly want to understand what it means to us as well. And Father, we want to pray, please, will you open up our hearts to receive, you know, our eyes to see, and our minds to understand. So at the end of the day, Father, we may grow spiritually and understand more of your word and to be able to apply what we've learned in our own lives. As we pray, Father, in Jesus' precious name, enable me as well as your servant to, to teach your people. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's start off with our passage. And that is Revelation chapter 2 from verse 12, where we have the letter of Jesus Christ to the church in Pergamos. And this is what it says. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, that you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas my, uh, was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold to, uh, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Verse, verse 16. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. That's a mouthful. That's an absolute mouthful. But believe it, Jesus has a few things to say to this church, to this local congregation. And this is how Jesus identifies himself to the church. He says, you has this sharp two-edged sword. Now, if you remember, if you go back to, to Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, Jesus had a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And what this two-edged um, sword basically represents is judgment. And it's judgment on those who attack his people. All right? Or those who want to destroy his church. He will basically attack them with a sword. It's judgment from Jesus Christ upon those who dare to attack his people or to try to destroy his church. Now, Jesus says the following to the church at Pergamos. He says, I know your works. Okay, So he knows the works of the church. He knows everything they do. Uh, what they do for him. Uh, what they do for themselves. Uh, whatever they do. Jesus knows what they did. That's, that's for sure. Nothing is hidden from the eyes of Jesus Christ with regards to his church. He, remember, he's the one who walks among the lampstands. 
He's the one who sees everything that there is to see. It, it's, there's nothing in the church that is hidden from Christ. All right? But then there's another thing that Jesus says, and that is that he knows where they dwell. He knows where the church is located. Because that is an important thing described here specifically with regards to the church in Pergamos. Now the specific thing that Jesus mentions about the location is this, that the church is at the same location where the throne of Satan is. Now John MacArthur has the following to say in his commentary on this verse. He says, Where Satan's throne is, is basically the headquarters of satanic opposition and a Gentile base for false religion. On the uh, Acropolis in Pergamos was a huge throne shaped altar um, to Zeus. In addition, Asclepios, the god of healing, was the god most associated with Pergamos. His snake-like form is still the, the medicine symbol even today. End quote. That's interesting. That medicine was associated with this snake-like form. Eh? And that it's even the same thing today. The snake-like deity um, form with regards to medicine. Now if we go back to the Garden of Eden. You remember it was the snake. It was the serpent. Eh? Ser Satan that came in the form of a snake or a serpent. That came to Eve and deceived Eve. It wasn't the snake, it was Satan was taking possession of the serpent. Now I find it strange that the Western world, especially with its long Christian heritage, that, that they will still continue to embrace a symbol in medicine that is this kind of, of symbol. Knowing that what, what the serpent stands for in, in the scriptures now. But anyway, that, that's what they do. Now, we know that the Bible teaches that God is the one who heals. I don't know why they use this, this serpent shape, except if it, it, if it has roots in pagan mythology and that kind of thing, which obviously it has. But I mean, we know from Scripture, and especially anybody that's got anything to do with Christian heritage or Christian beliefs, they will know that we believe very strongly that God is the one who heals. God is the one uh, who can do the impossible. Uh, it's just very interesting that a deity like this will be accepted in medicine. Now, there was also in Pergamos a very famous medicine school. And it was connected to this, uh, the, the, what do you call it, the Asclepios Temple. Now, at this medicine school, According to John MacArthur, they basically mingled medicine with superstition. Very interesting. They mingled uh, medicine with superstition. It's, it's much like what they want to do now in South Africa again. You know, bringing in your Sangomas as traditional healers. Yes, they're traditional healers, but then registering them as medical doctors. So what they're doing is they are mingling two things with one another. The one is purely based on medicine, purely based on science of medicine, which means they go and do tests and see whether things work. There's no supernatural element to, to medicine in general, in the West specifically. But what they try to do now is to incorporate two, these two things, to basically bring medicine, which is a medical science, and then this supernatural side to bring these two together. And this was basically what happened in Pergamos at, the, at this medicine school. Now, superstition, if, you, if I could use a basic definition of what superstition is, superstition is, a, is, a wild, is widely held by, by uh, how can I say, yeah, it's something that's widely held, wildly, wide, widely, sorry, widely held, but um, it's this irrational belief in supernatural influences, that things can be influenced supernaturally. The Western world does not really completely accept the supernatural or the demonic or the occult world when it comes to medicine. I know very few, uh, to be honest with you, I don't know any at this stage. I knew one doctor, medical doctor, that would actually go into the spiritual side of things to, to see whether there isn't a, a spiritual problem 
with the patient and then also obviously look at the the, the physical side now the medicine side of things uh, there, there are a lot of how can I say doctors medical doctors who are believers uh, who struggle to go to the Bible with regards to medicine they, they don't even go to the supernatural side they struggle to understand or accept what the Bible teaches about um, God's ability to heal you know very few of them there are obviously there are but there are very few of them that would bring God into the equation and say we need to pray about that and, and so on uh, it's not a reflection on, on doctors in the in a negative sense I'm just saying that's normally what happens in the medical medicine world or the medical world is you will find in the medical world that they are more how can I say prone towards just plain medicine the science of medicine rather than the spiritual side of things uh, that does not include supernatural things you know in the sense of uh, the way that Sangomas would do it but anyway um, superstition is is one way for the Western world to basically to try and explain the supernatural uh, unexplainable things that actually happens where people are actually truly healed so or where things happen they will just plainly say no that's superstition you know instead of tr really trying to find out what 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 the source of this is how how these things work and so on but anyway um i remember while i was on the mission field that was uh, and i was there for a few years my understanding of the supernatural world really changed quite a lot it was greatly shaped during that specific time now i've learned that demons are indeed real that they are spiritual beings and that they are very real and that they can do real things to real people even medical things i've, I've seen uh, people whose legs swell up three four times the size of of their legs uh, and it's because they've been bewitched and then what we do is when we uh, come in the name of Jesus Christ and pray that God would deliver them from these demonic influences um, at the end of the campaign and sometimes that same day or the next day or so on the, the legs would be healed uh, we, we have we, we had many many um, situations where supernatural things really happened and uh, medicine just couldn't get a how, how can I say medicine just couldn't give an answer to what was really happening uh, and it was through prayer and God's grace and God's healing power that people were basically healed and we give him all the glory um, I'm not saying for one moment that we get the glory or anything like that no God gets the glory God is the one who who heals people uh, according to his will whenever he wants to all right but there is a, definitely I've learned that there is a, f a spiritual world out there and there are spiritual realities that as a western person i kind of used to dug and dive and try to get away from but these things are very much real okay and and i've learned that these spiritual beings these demons will take control of somebody's body uh if that, if that person allows them to do so i mean demons possess people and they enable people to do things that is just physically impossible to do demons also heal people we've seen that happen uh, seen demons uh, work in people or how can I say speak through people in tongues you know especially when it comes to healing uh, demons will will heal people but it will come at a cost normally what they do is they were the cause of the sickness anyway so what they do is they stop that sickness and then they so healing has actually taken place but they just cause another uh, sickness that's basically how it works because they're the ones that basically started the sickness in the person in the first place now what normally happens is in the spiritual world you just kind of exchange one evil for another evil you go to the sangoma to get healing they pray for you uh, or the sangoma not pray for you sorry man the, the sangoma gives you muti or do rituals or whatever and you get healed from that problem problem that you have and you will just start another problem okay because it becomes this vicious circle and you just got to go to a stronger stronger sangoma just called uh, just cost you more and more and more money i remember working with a sisutu lady uh, for for a few years 
And I mean, she was quite sick. And um, she was told by the ancestors in a dream that she would she had to go and um, go for for tra training to become a traditional healer. And if she would go for for that training, then she would no longer have that it uh, you know that kind of illness. So she went for the training. She became a sangoma, and uh, she even started training other sangomas. And she was healed from this one sickness, this illness that she started off. But she got very sick, very ill with other things. And it so happened that the Lord used her chronic illness to actually expose her to the preaching of the gospel, to the truth of the, go of the gospel, the truth about the spirit world, the truth about ancestors and the uh, worship of ancestors and, and songomas and all these kind of things. Uh, I remember she, she told us that she took her car to a panel beater who told her to to basically um, get her car fixed. That's how it happened. And she got the car fixed. And when the car was fixed, he said to her, all right, now the car is fixed. Now it's time to get your life fixed up. And he told her where her tent was and that she should go there and go and listen to what they have to say because we, he believed that the Lord wanted her to go to get her life sorted out and her life fixed up. You know, so um, by God's grace, she went and she, she walked into the tent and they were preaching the gospel and they were sharing on the the spirit world and they were sharing on what the scriptures had to say about um, the spirit world and and some gomas doing these things through familiar spirits and what the scripture says that these things are an abomination in god's sight and and so on and as she was listening she came very strongly convicted by the holy spirit that what she was doing was not right and she went to the front of the tent and um by God's grace, God saved her. At first, she was knocked out by the demons because the demons didn't want her to, to speak to these um, evangelists. But uh, praise God, she woke up and she heard the gospel and she uh, came to a saving knowledge of faith in Jesus Christ. And the Lord delivered her from these demons. And she had a, a pharmacy with a lot of traditional stuff that, was, that she burned. And um, she was part of the team when... Um, I was there, I, and, and I, I had time to sit with her, hours and hours, where I could just sit and listen, and her help me to understand how the spiritual world works, because I come from a background where these things were all just superstition, and w that's where I learned, but no, it's not just superstition, and when I started working with people, and I realized, but whoa, there is a spiritual reality, and then when I started reading scripture, and I said, but Jesus worked with us, and Jesus uh, didn't deny it, didn't say it was superstition. Jesus said it was true, and he worked with it as if these entities, these things were real. These uh, fallen angels were real. So he cast out demons, and um, he gave that authority also to his disciples. And we are called to cast out dem demons whenever we see them, all right? Whenever we, we face them, we don't have to go and look for them, We but when we face it, we are given the authority in scripture that in the name of Jesus Christ, they have to go. Right, but she helped me. Um, you know, so the, the problem is that there are many people who are caught up in the works of darkness and they need deliverance. And the way they, the deliverance can come to them because they are caught up in the works of darkness is through spiritual means. It is God through his Holy Spirit who delivers people from these demon influences. So the medical world has its place with all the science and all the, all the things. But then the spiritual side has also got its place. And we need to figure out, and this is sometimes the hard one. I would sit in counseling sessions with people and I would listen to them, listen to their story. And many times I just had to say, listen, you want me to pray for your problem. But I really don't think your problem is spiritual. I think your problem is physical. I would sit in front of a, a, a person that would be sitting in front of me that are clearly overweight. And then they come to me to pray for their legs because their legs are really painful when they walk and so on. And, and I have to sit in front of them and say, listen, I, I will pray that God will really help you to be disciplined in not eating uh, as much as you are eating. And to get some exercise and to... So that at the end of the day, you can lose some weight so that your, bo your legs do not have to carry as much weight as it is. And, and because your problem is a physical problem, it's not a spiritual problem. But then, as I said before, we had cases where people's legs were swollen and it was definitely spiritual. And once we prayed about it and once the Lord delivered that person from 
the witchcraft and the things that was involved, um, by God's grace, they, they, the swelling in the legs just went down. You know, so you've you got to trust the Lord to show you wh- wh- whether it's physical, whether you need medical science, or whether it's spiritual, and you trust the Lord that he's going to deliver that person. And and it's not for us. I, it was never for me to, to, to try to intercede and to take over where medicine is supposed to, to do things, you know, so let the person go and see the doctor we've done it many times i tell them go and see the doctor and see if they can do something and if they can't do something for you then come back to me or we can start off uh, we can pray about this and if god heals you we praise him for that uh, and then or you 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 let me pray for you and then you can go and see the doctor as well at the same time you know we we, we try to be balanced okay so in this in pergamus where this this um this medical school was they were teaching much what we are seeing happening in South Africa now, this mixture between medicine and let's call it the traditional um, healing methods, which includes uh, contact with the ancestor spirits. In South Africa specifically, it's like that. Contact with the ancestor spirits where um, the healing takes place not through a physical examination uh, as such, but rather a uh, uh, listening very closely and um, means to to get the information from the spirit world of what is wrong with this person, and then they will give some other muti that could be a a plant or it could be something else that is mixed, so that the person can then have a physical kind of a medicine thing that they can use to help them to to recover. All right. So, for example, here in Pergamus, at this this medicine school, as they call it, where medicine was mixed with superstition or medicine was mixed with the supernatural uh, one prescription was for example that the patient should go and sleep on the temple floor and during the night snakes would come and they will crawl over this patient's body and then the snakes will infuse this person this patient with their snake healing powers you know so when that person wakes up in the morning, the snake healing powers, because the snakes crawled all over these, these patients, uh, would, would basically heal those people. And that would be some of the superstitions, one of the superstitions that was part of this uh, medicine school. The thing is, at the end of the day, beloved, um, yes, there are definitely superstitions out there. There's no two ways about it. But whenever it, we, we are talking about the seat of Satan, you know, uh, this temple of Zeus that was erected or the statue for, for Zeus. And, and you have this um, dwelling place of Satan. You definitely are not going to just work with superstition. It's going to be supernatural. It's going to be demonic. It's going to be occultic. It's going to be um, something that is not what God wants. That's for sure. All right. So in the city of Pergamos, that is exactly what we what we see in that city. But in the, the medicine school, it, they, they normally try to mix things. I, I take, for example, yoga. Yoga is something that comes completely from the, from the East. Uh, and we, if you speak to gurus as well, if you speak to yogi, they will tell you that it is definitely something that you, you may contact with the spirit world, the kundalini spirit that moves up the spine of a person, for example, that goes through the different chakras. Uh, it is it is absolutely demonic, right? And and to get to the point where you are enlightened now, where the third eye is opened up and you are you are illuminated, um, you know th- those kind of things are all um, related to to Eastern religious practices uh, that's directly connected to the works of darkness or to the occult. And what they've done in the West is they've just taken those practices and Westernized it. Uh, in a certain sense, the way that they do it with medicine, they take they've taken medicine and the 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 good side of medicine, or the let's say the physical side of medicine, the physical medicine, the physical uh, things that they make, the pharmaceutical products, and what they've done is they are now mixing it with the spiritual, all right, and it's it's coming in there. And by the way, uh, I believe that everybody is religious. Everybody is religious. There's nobody that's not religious. So even if you have a medical doctor that says, no, I just work with medicine. No, no, no. He's being influenced by his religion. Whatever that doctor's um, religion is, he will be influenced by his religion because his religion is his belief system. 
It's what he believes. When he looks at a person, how does he see that person? If you look at, for example, if somebody is a, an atheist and they believe in evolution, then they believe that uh, people are uh, placed on this earth by chance. Yeah? It was soup. We all originate from a soup. And um, an atheist will definitely not look at, at, at um, human life the way that a Christian would, where we believe that we are created in the image of God. In the likeness of God we are created. Male and female we have been created, which means life is very, very special. So a Christian medical doctor will look at a, a life in front of him completely different to an atheist, for example. Somebody that has a very strong belief in evolution. Even though that person might have a very strong heart and a passion for, for medicine and a passion for the patient, it's still not the same because they will be influenced by the, the religious uh, beliefs that they, that they do have. All right, if you go to a, a, a medical center, for example, where you have traditional healers that are placed on the same level as normal medical doctors, their traditional beliefs, you know, the African religion that they come from, has a completely different understanding of who God is and what creation is and how things work and how the cosmos works. You know, so those kind of things are, are, are very important for us to understand. But in Pergamos, you had this medicine school, very interesting, and in how they function. Now, when we, just to go back quickly to the city of Pergamos, I need to close up. Um, I'm running out of time. In the city of Pergamos, where this medicine, medicine school was situated, it was actually a very interesting city because the, the name Pergamos literally means citadel. It is the, the word um, from which we get the, the word uh, parchment. You know the material that was developed from animal, animal skins, that parchment? Uh, it was uh, apparently first developed in this area where Pergamos is. The city was built on a hill about 305 meters high. Okay, and um, it, it was at the foot of a huge fertile plain of about 32 kilometers. You know, so amazing city to be in, very fertile ground. Uh, in this in this fertile plain area, and Pergamus was also the capital of the Roman of uh, the Roman province of Asia Minor for more than two hundred and fifty years. It um, housed cults, a lot of cults developed from Pergamus that basically found their their homes in Pergamus, uh, like for example the cult of Athena, the cult of uh, Asclepios, the cult of Dionysus. Um, it's also called the cult of Bacchus, now the god of drunkenness. And then there's also the cult of Zeus. Uh, Pergamus was also the first city in Asia to build a temple to Caesar in 29 before Christ. And it became the, the capital of the cult of Caesar worship. So Pergamus was a very interesting city. And, and the amazing thing is, what does God do? What does God do? He comes and he plants a Christian church, poof, in Pergamos, right there where the seat of Satan is. Christ plants his church, and then he goes and he walks among his church, and he sees all these things that he, his church does, and, and he knows their situation. He knows that they are in a very difficult um, place to, to be because there are enormous demonic influences, enormous influence, enormous works of darkness that's going on in that place. Yet that's exactly where Jesus Christ in his power and his authority, and that's what is so amazing about it, is that God comes and he decides, yep, he's going to put a church right there, and by his power, he plants a church, people get saved out of this, this demonic uh, environment people get saved and voila you've got the church the church of Pergamos that is now there to shine their light in the midst of the darkness around them in the midst of all these cult groups because the church needs to be, be where darkness is the church does not have to be where the light is because the light's already there if there's a church already fantastic that church need to shine their light but here in Pergamos, there was no witness, there was no testimony, there was no light. 
So Jesus comes and he plants a church. And voila, the light starts shining in Pergamos. Absolutely amazing. All right. So the church knew what it meant to, to live and function inside a pagan, idolatrous city. That's why Jesus could commend them, but at the same time, Jesus could speak on certain things that they needed to look at. And that what we will do is, God willing, next time, if it be God's will, um, we will continue. Because remember, verse 13 tells us that um, he says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. What a city, but amazingly more. What a place to be church, where Satan dwells. That's where the church started, and that's where yeah, Antipas became a martyr. But we, got, God willing, we can look at it God willing, next time. So let's close our eyes in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can come to you again. And thank you so much that we can learn so much from this uh, the city, the city of Pergamos. And thank you for the message that Jesus Christ gives to us through this city so that we can learn. And Father, I pray, please enable us to learn. There's so much to learn. And enable me as your servant to teach your people those things that they need to learn. And I pray, Father, please, in Jesus' name as well, be with us. And as we dwell in in cities and towns where it's definitely not all light, I pray that you will enable us to be the kind of people that you want us to be. That our testimony will be a testimony that uh, in which you are glorified. Go with us during this week, Father. Until we meet again, God willing, next time. Thank you so much for this privilege again. As we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much for listening. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, that His face will shine upon you, and that He will give you His peace. God willing, until next time. Bye-bye.